This morning, I want to talk about walking in victory. Amen? Amen. So this is Palm Sunday. I don't have a a Palm Sunday message per se, uh, but uh, walking in victory, Palm Sunday was all about Jesus coming in victorious into Jerusalem, making his triumphant entrance into Jerusalem in Luke 19, 36. of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice, uh, a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Amen. So they're, they're shouting, they're, they're blessing Jesus as he comes into Jerusalem by the Mount of Olives. And it said that they shouted with a loud voice. Now, in the Bible, when when Soldiers would come home, home from war after a victory. They'd be dancing and shouting and parading in the streets. Amen. And there was this, just this energy. And so you can imagine that Jesus coming into Jerusalem was the same type of energy as soldiers coming back from a big victory, from a battle, a big victory. And, and, and so the celebration of Jesus riding into town on a donkey and people are laying down palm branches, we're celebrating a victory. Amen. And so remember, at this point, Jesus hadn't went to the cross. Amen. He hadn't been beaten and whipped. He hadn't been crucified. He hadn't been laid in the tomb yet. He hadn't defeated death, hell, and the grave yet. He hadn't risen from the grave. Amen. He wasn't sitting on the right hand of the Father yet. But this was a foreshadowing. This was um, something that in in the Old Testament said what would happen, that he would ride in on a donkey, on a colt, which was... Very humble, right? Uh, you don't just, you know, he could have ridden on a horse. He could have ridden on something that was a lot more extravagant, but he chose to ride on a donkey to hum- just as a sign of humbling himself. And what did Jesus do on the cross? He humbled himself for us, didn't he? He humbled himself to take the beating and to take the things that he had to go through and to be humiliated on the cross for us, right? In ancient times, the one thing that palm branches signified was victory. Amen. And so there is this, there is this victory, this triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And uh, he had done signs and wonders and miracles. And it says that they began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. But really, this was a, this was a triumphal entry to Jerusalem for what he was going to do. Amen. It was for what he was going to do. Not, not necessarily what has been done, but in the, in, in the plan of Jesus and in the Lord for all eternity... Throughout history, this was, this was this moment. This was signifying that there's going to be a great victory won. Amen. Amen. And sometimes it's so hard to, when we're going through circumstances, to see the victory through the circumstance. Sometimes it's hard to see the victory through the storm. Again, Jesus hadn't done anything uh, as far as um, salvation, going to the cross, resurrecting, sitting on the right hand of the Father. He hadn't done any of those things yet. But this celebration was a foreshadowing of the victory by Jesus through the cross and the resurrection. Amen? And that's why Palm Sunday is so important. You know, and, and, and every day is important, right? Every day we want to acknowledge what Jesus did for us. But today we, we celebrate the victory uh, that we know is coming, um, two, that was coming 2,000 years ago. Amen? That we now have, hallelujah, this victory. It also reminds us that because he has the victory, we have the victory. Amen. We have the victory in our own lives. Daily in our life, we have victory. Amen. And I believe there's some key things we need to know to experience victory every single day. And when I talk about experiencing victory, I don't mean that everything's always going to go your way. Right? I think all of us can attest to that, that uh, that there's things that have happened that uh, we know, you know, isn't what God wants for us, right? We have an adversary who's the devil, right? But we can live and walk in victory every single day, regardless of what our circumstances show us, regardless of what happened in our life. Because the Bible says we have the victory and God's given it to us, uh, that's, that's all that matters, amen, what the Bible says, right? 
And so we're going to talk about some things uh, that will really show us how we already have this victory, how we already are triumphant, amen, and how the Lord has really brought us along with him uh, into this triumph- triumphant entry, right? Amen. And so we have to understand, we might say, well, how is it, is, a, is it a victory if I didn't get the outcome that I wanted? Well, we have to understand as a Christian, victory happens first in the spiritual realm, Right? So even though Jesus hadn't gone to the cross, he hadn't died, hasn't resurrected yet, in the spirit realm, victory had already been won. Amen? When Jesus came, you know, in in the Old Testament, it was was prophesied when, when the Lord cursed the ground for man's sake. But what did he say? He said, and, you know, for the women, for the childbearing, it says that he will bruise your heel, but you will, you will bruise his head, right? What is he talking about? Well, us as, um, you know, uh, as mankind through Jesus Christ and those who believe on him will bruise the head of the serpent, right? The enemy. The enemy is under our feet. So it's foreshadowing this victory that was going to take place. Amen. Amen. So all throughout the Old Testament, you see these signs that point to Jesus. You see these signs that point to uh, how the enemy is going to be defeated and the saints are going to, going to be in glory with the Lord. Amen. And so we have got to understand that, again, it happens in the spiritual first, and then it happens in the physical. An example would be our healing. 1 Peter 2.24 says, Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, have died, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. So the Bible tells me I'm healed. Amen. The doctor might not tell me I'm healed. My circumstances or my, my symptoms might, tell, might not tell me that I'm healed. But I don't want to go by my feelings. I want to go by the Word of God. Amen. Amen. I talked about it a couple weeks ago or maybe it was last week. Um, just our attitude. Amen. And, and whatever is going on in our life, we always want to believe what the Bible says about us. Amen. And if we do that, we're going to have an elevated attitude. Because we know we live victorious. We know what Jesus said. We know that the Bible says we're, we're more than conquerors. Amen. So we want to live up here. This is where the Word of God is. We want to live up here. Put our head, the, Bible, the Lord is a lifter up of our head to Him and not down at ourselves, at our circumstances. But it says, by whose stripes you were healed. Now we say, if you were healed, that means you are healed. Right. Amen. So the Bible tells me, that I'm healed, and we know the Bible is the truth, even if I don't feel healed, I don't go by my feelings, amen, I go by the Word of God. If the Bible says it, I want to believe it. I talked again about last time about, as Christians, how we want to take the Bible at face value, right? If it's in the Word, amen, and it's for you, and it's good, receive it. Amen, Amen, because that's His will for your life. That's his will for you, good things. Every good and every perfect gift comes from God. You know, right before that, the scripture says, do not be deceived, brethren. Anytime the Bible says, do not be deceived, you know that that's a deception, that's that's a tool of the enemy to use to say, well, not everything good comes from God, right? But it says, do not be deceived. Every good and every perfect gift comes from God. The Father of light, there's no variation or shadow in turning, amen. And so we don't go by our feelings, we go by what the word of God says. The Bible says that we already have the victory, so we want to believe it. Let's go to Joshua 1.11. So I was talking with Carolyn, I think, on Wednesday, and, and we were both, uh, neither of us told each other what we were going to talk about this morning, and I said, you know what, uh, God's going to, uh, it, it wouldn't be cool if the Lord just connected our, our messages a little bit. And so this is the scripture she had this morning, and I wanted to read it. Uh, it says, pass through the camp and command the people, saying, prepare provisions for yourselves, for within three days you will cross over this Jordan to go into the, to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess. Amen. You could also say it like this, in the which the Lord your God gave you to possess, right? Because he promised them this land. And we know that God is not slack concerning his promises. We know that what he, when he promises something, he, it, he follows through. Amen. 
But it says that you're going to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess. We all have land that we want to possess in our life. And those lands are healing, amen, financial prosperity, good relationships, hallelujah, revelation of the word, uh, good grades, a good job, being a light to people. Those are lands, amen, in our life. And the Bible says that, that when the Lord gives you something, that you can go and possess it. But we have to possess it. Amen. He's available. It's available to us through what Jesus did. And we do have the victory, but we still need to go and possess the land. Amen. We're in, we're in uh, college basketball season heating up right now. And you have the really good team, the first round, the, really, the best team in the in, in the NCAA against um, the worst team that made it in the tournament, okay? And the best team every time feels like, I'm going to win this game. We're going to win this game. Um, this is just a formality, right? This, this game is. But what, do they just get the victory just because they believe it? No, they have to go and possess it, don't they? They have to go out and actually do something. They have to go and prove that they're the better team, amen? In years, years past, they have proven sometimes they're not the better team that particular day, Right? But as Christians, we have to do the same thing. We can, we can read it, and we can study it, and we can hear it, and we can say, Lord, I know that you give me the victory, hallelujah. But then you have to go out and possess the victory. Amen. 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 You have to take the victory. The Bible says that we're not only hearers of the word, but we're doers of the word. As we do the word, victory, we see these victories happening in our life. Amen. So there's three things that I have here that I feel like we need to know to, have, to live a victorious life. And I know there's more. Um, don't come up to me after the service and say, well, Pastor, there's, four, actually, there's actually six I read uh, things. Well, these, these three are what the Lord gave me. But the first key to living in victory, Jesus won for us at the cross, is knowing our enemy and knowing that he's already defeated. Amen. Amen. We have an enemy. He doesn't want us to know the truth about our victory. And that enemy is the devil. He's our adversary. John 10.10 says, uh, he only comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. 1 Peter 5.8 says, he's our adversary, our enemy, and he walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Revelation 12.10 says, he's the accuser of the brethren. So he sits there and continually wants to tell us things that we've done wrong, right? He continually wants to make you feel guilty about past mistakes that we've made. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 14 says he tries to deceive us by pretending to be an angel of light, right? He walks like an angel of light. It says he can transform himself into an angel of light, right? John 8, 44 says that the devil was a murderer from the beginning and that when he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. So we, we, we have this adversary, this enemy. You know, Pastor Dave always talks about, uh, you know, when, when we're playing a sport, there's an opponent, right? And they, we know that they're an opponent because of the different jersey that they have on from us. And to win, you have to know who you're competing against. That's right. If you don't know who you're competing against, I'm playing basketball and I pass the ball to somebody, and he's not on my team, that's not good, right? So I need to know who I'm competing against. Who's my opponent? I only want to pass the ball to the guy in the same jersey as me, right? You know, I coach eighth grade basketball. Sometimes, a lot of times, we'll pass the ball to the wrong person. It's called a turnover, right? But spiritually, I need to know, okay, who's for me and who's against me? I need to know that, okay, there is actually somebody against me, right? There's, there are churches that don't preach anything about heaven, hell, that don't preach anything about Satan, and not that we're giving him any airtime, except to say that he's defeated. Amen. Amen. But we, we got to know, okay, the Lord is for me. The devil is against me. I'm going to side with the Lord. I'm going to side with, with, with what he says about me. But that's who the devil is, devil is in a nutshell. He's, he's a murderer. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. He's an accuser. He's an adversary, he's a devourer, 
And he only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's who our adversary is. Amen? In life, Jesus has won the victory for us. So we, have, we do have an adversary. And we don't, we don't, you know, we should not be afraid of the devil. You should not be afraid of the devil. You should not be wondering, oh, I wonder how the devil is going to attack me today. No. We want to wonder, how, how, how is the Lord going to bless me today? What does the Lord say about me today? What does he say about my circumstance? What does he say about uh, what's going on? What does he say about my health? What does he say about my finances, my needs? Amen. What does he say about my righteousness? The righteousness of, or the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. What does he say about my salvation? Amen. Amen. So because Jesus has won the victory for us, that means we've won too. We've already won. Thank you, Jesus. But if we put our trust in what the devil says rather than faith in his word, we're going to live in the deception that we've lost, right? We're going to live in, in the deception that, man, this life is just too hard. I can't do it. How, what am I supposed to do? You see many people living in this deception of, I should just give up on life. What's the point of living? Depression rates have gone up. Suicide rates have gone up right? But no, we have, we have hope. Praise the Lord. And he wants us to share that hope with other people. There are a lot of different voices in the world. You can listen to a lot of different things, right? But the Word of God is the voice of God. So when we read the Word of God, we're listening to the voice of God. Hallelujah. When, when Elijah uh, heard the still, small voice, that still, small voice is like the Word of God to us. He speaks to us through his Word. He speaks to us as we pray and as we, um, as we seek him, amen? amen? The Bible says, draw near to me and, and he'll draw near to us. Thank you, Lord. When the devil tries to tell us a lie, we go on the offensive with the word. When the devil says you can't be victorious in this battle, we go to the word. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says, thanks be to God who gives us the victory amen. through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory. Amen. All the, all the hard, you know, we still have to live life. We still have to claim things. But all the hard work was done on Calvary. All the hard work was done on the cross and the resurrection. Right? So if he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, and Jesus has already been to the cross and finished the work by being crucified and raised from the dead, then we know that we've already won. Amen. We know that we've already won. The devil's lost. John 16, 33 says, these themes I have spoken to you, that in me you have, may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Right. He has, past tense, he's already overcome the world. Amen. And I love it, you just, you know, the transitive property, because Jesus has overcome the world, and Jesus lives in you. Amen. The Holy Spirit lives in you. The Bible says, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. That means we have overcome the world. You have overcome the world through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So that temptation doesn't have to bother you. That temptation doesn't have to overcome what you've put in in your study and, and, and just the relationship you have with Jesus. Amen. He's already defeated. We can say no. We can say stop it, devil, in Jesus' name. Right? He has to listen to you. Right? Remember when Jesus was going to, uh, when, he, when he told the demons to leave the possessed man, and they said, what did they say? They didn't say, don't cast us out. No, he had already done it. He said, don't send us off into the abyss. Cast us out into these pigs over here, right? They didn't have a choice whether or not to be cast out, right? They just, they begged not to be cast out into some other dark place and, and, and put into the pigs. So in your life, when the temptation comes up, in your life, and you rebuke that temptation, it has to leave. Amen. Amen? It has to leave. It has to go away. 1 John 5, 4 says, For everyone born of God overcomes the world. Amen. Wow. Everyone born of God, everyone who puts their faith in Jesus Christ says, has overcome the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. So when we mix our faith 
with the grace given by Jesus Christ, we can experience that victory in our life every day. The Bible says, by grace we have been saved through faith. If we don't, it'll be hard for us to live victoriously. If we don't mix our faith, and, and again, that's, that's what I, when I'm talking about grabbing and taking the victory and, and walking in it, we're walking by faith, amen, amen. every single day that what the Bible says is true about us. Right. We're walking in faith every single day that God is going to take care of us, that he has taken care of us, amen. So the first step to living in victory is that Jesus won at the cross, knowing our enemy is already defeated. The second thing we need to know is what strategy to use to fight the devil uh, and his attacks. Again, we're not scared of the devil. We don't want to be fearful that uh, because things are going so well in our life, oh, something bad's going to happen. No, we don't have to think like that, right? right? But we, we do, through the Word of God, want to be ready, right? We just read that it says, be sober, be vigilant, be aware, be alert. Be ready. Amen. Galatians 5.16 says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So being led by the Spirit means that we're being led by the Spirit according to the Word. So that's really important, okay, because people can feel like they're led by the Spirit, but have no doctrine or word in them, and it kind of gets a little goofy, right? right. There was a, a, a minister from um, yesteryear, William Branham. I don't know heard of, who's heard of William Branham, and um, had visitations from angels and from the Lord, and just did all these miracles and wonderful things. One thing, though, is he couldn't read. He, didn't, he, was, he couldn't read, and so he, couldn't, he didn't read the Bible. But, he, but God had, had empowered him and anointed him with visions and amazing things. Well, after a little while, he started hearing voices that weren't God's. But he thought they were, right? He wasn't grounded in the Word. He was in the Spirit, amen, and the Lord was using him for mighty things, but little by little got deceived and got down this wrong path. So when we walk in the Spirit, it doesn't mean like I'm just walking on a cloud, you know, just kind of going about my life. No, I'm walking in the Spirit according to the Word of God. So the Spirit and the Word have to come come together. They have to connect. Walking in the Spirit means relying on the Holy Spirit and what He has to offer you according to the Word. Amen? How we respond to situations we face is half the battle. Again, I talked about our attitude, right? How we respond to attacks from the enemy is half the battle. How are you going to take it? When, some, when life throws something at you, how are you going to handle that? <clears throat> Many times, the different strategies we use are the different fruits of the Spirit. So we're walking in the Spirit. Galatians 5.16 says we walk in the Spirit and we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. So when we walk in the Spirit, we're using the fruits of the Spirit right? So many times, if we just, uh, you know, if we're, if we're going through a struggle and we just pray and the Lord gives us a word, maybe joy, right? And which is the fruit of the Spirit. And we just start saying, no, I'm going to have joy. That's, that's going to take care of whatever that issue was. Or we might say, just have peace. Start just, Lord, thank you for your peace. And that's going to take care of some of the things that are going on. Galatians 5.22, we'll just go through the, the fruits of the Spirit. It says that the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such, there is no law. So I encourage you, if you're going through something in your life, go to Galatians 5.22 and 23. And just say, okay, what do I need? What do I need right now? You need G's, that's right. But are you going through something and a word sticks out to you? Maybe it's gentleness, maybe it's faithfulness, maybe it's goodness, maybe it's self-control. I think self-control is a big one for a lot of us, right? Just having self-control over whatever it is. Maybe it's peace. Whatever it is, the Bible says there's no law against it, right? So anything that you, that you choose um, to really emphasize in a battle, in something that you're facing, 
um, is always going to be a good choice. The Bible is so rich in revelation and wisdom that we have so many tools at our disposal that the Lord has given us, but it really can be as simple as, man, I just need more love in my life. I just need more peace in my life, right? I just need more self-control, whatever it is. You know, and Satan is going to change the way he attacks you, right? I've, I've told I'm not going to read uh, the verses, but I, and I've mentioned it so many times, but, you know, David fought the, fought the Philistines twice, really close together in the same valley, valley, the same enemy and everything, but God gave him a different strategy both times, right? So we have to continually go to the Holy Spirit. We want to inquire of how to use those things. When Jesus was in the wilderness, the Bible shows us at least three different things that the devil tried to bring against him. It wasn't just the same thing every time. It wasn't the pride of life three times, right? No, he tempted him in the lust of the flesh, the, pride of, uh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, right? And every time, Jesus didn't use the same scripture, right? No, every time he said something different. There was something else that he used to thwart the attack of the enemy. In our life, we can do the same thing, right? There might be something that comes um, onto you, and the Lord gives you a certain scripture, and that, so you want to speak that scripture. But if it happens again, maybe there's something different that you, that you need to be speaking. Speaking the word of God over your life unlocks the victory for you. Amen? Unlocks that victory that we already have. <clears throat> and this leads me to the third thing. Third thing we need to know is how to use our weapons, right? If I'm in an army and they give me a gun, and I've never shot a gun before, I've, I've shot not very many guns before. Luke knows. <clears throat> um, but they don't show me how to use it. How am I going to be successful? I'm going to be a detriment to the army. I'm not going to be anything positive to the army, right? If I can't use my weapon, right? If... Uh, you know, if I'm, if I'm a, you know, supposed to fly a jet, you know, uh, you know, and whatever, I don't know. And I don't know how to fly the jet. It's not going to work out very well for me, is it? Right. So we've got to know how to use the strategies that God has given us. And I think I've told this story before, but uh, Kirk Snaza actually was here one time, and he talked about humility, and he, and he likened humility to a, a beautiful a painting that was done by uh, a really good uh, painter, an artist. And, uh, and, and this artist was a father, and it was very intricate, and took a lot of time just to get the details right. And when he was done, he just gave it to his son. He said, son, I want you to put your initials on this, right? Um, he painted this beautiful thing, but he gave it to his son, and he said, I want you to put your initials on it, and I want you to carry it around like it's yours. And, and uh, he said how sometimes people walk around and tell people to look at our artwork and look at what we did, even though it was the Lord who put the work in, Right? It's the same with the battles that we win, right? So we can, God has given us this masterpiece, this victory, this beautiful victory with no, uh, with no casualties, amen. amen? And he wasn't even a casualty because he rose from the dead. So see what I did there? Um, so he gives us this beautiful victory. And he says to us, he says, here, you take the victory and I want you to carry it around. I want you to carry around the victory that I gave to you. Amen. amen. He gave us the keys, and now we get to carry around the victory that Jesus gave us on the cross. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Ephesians 6.10, a couple more and I'll be done here. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You know what the Bible says there? Is that we put on the whole armor of God. We put on his armor. We wear the armor of God and it's perfect. It's perfect for you. Amen. Uh, whatever attack, whatever fiery dart comes your way, you have something in your armor that is perfect for that situation. Yeah. And you have the armor on. Amen? Amen. So we're wearing God's armor. We're deploying his strategies. And each piece of armor that he gives us has a purpose. And then I'm just going to read through them real quick. Ephesians 6, 12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Therefore, having girded your waist with truth, 
having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, which with you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Something we don't think about maybe often is every piece of armor is for a purpose. And where, it, where Paul, the imagery that Paul places it is for a purpose. It protects us from specific things. And God's armor is actually named for what it will be used for. Amen. So if, if, you, if you're not quite sure uh, what to do in a situation, fruits of the Spirit, and look at the armor that he's given you to wear. When we put on the belt of truth, we're defending against the lies of the devil. When we put on the breastplate of righteousness, we're defending attacks of temptation, of sin, and self-doubt. Amen? Because 1 Corinthians 5.21 says that we're the righteousness of God, Christ Jesus. He's going to try to make you doubt yourself. What did, what did he, again, what did he say to Jesus? If you are the Son of God, if, if, if. He's going to make you question your identity in Jesus. But when we put on that breastplate of righteousness, we're defending attacks of temptation to sin and self-doubt. When we put on the shoes of the gospel of peace, we're defending against the attacks of anxiety. We can walk in peace. We don't have to walk in anxiety. We don't have to walk in fear. When we take up the shield of faith, we defend ourselves against the fiery darts of fear, right? We have faith. It defends us from uh, hearing the voices that are outside of the Word of God. Amen? Because the Bible says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Amen? So we have that shield of faith. Consequently, the shield is the only thing that we have to move up and down and defend, right? Faith is an act. It's an action. Amen? We use our faith. We, we um, deploy our faith. When we take the helmet of salvation, we're protecting our mind from the thoughts of unworthiness to be called children of God. We're telling the devil... I'm saved and I have the mind of Christ. Amen. That, that helmet of salvation, that, all, that very important helmet to say that, no, devil, the Holy Spirit says that he bears witness with my spirit that I am a child of God, that I have an inheritance into the kingdom. Amen. And when we take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, we attack Satan with the scriptures of truth. Amen. Amen. The sword of the Spirit, the word of God. He's given you truth through his word, amen. amen, and that word is in you, amen. When, every time we read it, that word goes into you and fills you up, amen. amen. And so that sword of the spirit, it's the offensive weapon against the devil. No, devil, it is written, amen. amen. Thank you, Lord. The word of God tells Satan what his future is and what his place is, amen. Right. amen. The Word of God, when you speak it, it tells him what his future is, and it tells you what your future is. Amen. It tells you what his will is for your life. The will of God is the Word of God for you. Amen. Amen. When we know who our adversary is, what strategy to use, and how to use the weapon God gave us, we just won't be victorious, but we'll live in victory continuously. So it's not about being victorious once, but it's about living in victory. Amen. Living in victory every single day. How can I uh, live today in victory just like I did the day before? How can I even be, do better? The Bible says we're more than conquerors. There's no ceiling to that, is there? Right. They just said we're conquerors, there's a ceiling. When the Bible says we're more than conquerors, there's no ceiling. We can live victorious. We can, we can live up here all the time. Right. Amen. Even when our circumstances try to tell us otherwise, if we try to use our own strength, we're always going to fail. But if we put on the armor of the Lord and use the weapons he's given us, we're always going to succeed. Amen. Always. Amen. Always going to succeed when we, when we use what God has given us. Amen? Amen? So just like David, you know, he, he got Saul's armor and it was too big for him and he couldn't move around. Uh, don't try to take armor for yourself. Only use what God has given you. Only use what God has given you. Amen? Amen. Well, Lord, we just thank you for this morning. Thank you that we can live in victory. Lord, we thank you that you have given us the victory, and we can live in that victory every single day. Father, I just pray uh, just for today uh, and, and moving forward that your people, that the people here in this place and listening online, 
will know who they are in Christ. Or that they'll know that, wow, I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to be worried about this or that. Now, I can be confident that he's given me the victory through Jesus Christ. I can be confident that I have all the tools at my disposal for any attack that might come. I have the confidence and the expectation to, ad- to advance against the kingdom of darkness. Not just to stand where we're at and fight off the devil, but we can advance. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, we just give you praise. We thank you. Lord, we thank you even, even you know, just for when they celebrated uh, uh, you 2,000 years ago, when they laid the palm branches down, when they laid the clothes down, Lord, that we can do that every single day, that we can prepare for a victory every single day in our life. And so we give you praise. Lord, I just declare a blessing on everybody here. I bless their, the rest of their day. I bless their week. Lord, I thank you for blessing their families. Anybody in their families that aren't saved, Lord, I thank you for that knowledge of Jesus Christ to come to them. Lord, I thank you for an encounter with you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And just help us again just to continually walk in victory, the victory that you gave us. So we give you praise and honor and all glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a clap offering. Thank you, Jesus. Say thank you for the victory. Say thank you for the victory. One, two, three. Thank you for the victory. Hallelujah.